Welcome to PayPod, the show that features thought-provoking interviews with leaders and entrepreneurs in the payments and financial technology industries. From credit card processing to Bitcoin, we cover it all. So if you want to know what's happening right now in the payments industry, stay tuned. Now, here's your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, how's it going, PayPod listeners? Scott back here with you, and welcome to another great episode of PayPod, the Payments and Fintech podcast. On this show, we simply love talking about payments, but the reality is, I think that sometimes our discussion focuses a bit too much on what's going on in payments in the United States. There's a whole world of payments out there, and every country has its own unique wrinkles, challenges, and opportunities in the payments industry. Today, we're going to be zeroing in our discussion on a country whose payments landscape ecosystem I'm eager to learn more about, India. Joining me to offer his unique insights is Nitya Sharma, co-founder and CEO of Simple. Simple is India's fastest growing buy now, pay later platform, which uses machine learning and AI to offer a quick, secure, and hassle-free payment experience to its users. So we have a co-founder of a company that's really at the heart of moving the payment experience in India forward. To me, that is the perfect guest for this topic. Let's dive right in. Nitya, welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott, for having me. Uh, It's a pleasure and excited about our chat. Absolutely. In today's show, as I said, we want to focus on the payments landscape in India specifically. It's a huge topic, and there's a lot to cover with it. We may not get to it all, but I'm hoping we can start by having you help the, set the stage, I guess, for us. Nitya, could you start by telling us a little bit about your background and how it motivated you to launch Simple and why the payments landscape is such an important thing to discuss. What's the size and real opportunity when it comes to payment services in India? Yeah, absolutely. So my background is I grew up in India, spent about a uh, decade in the United States where I went to college and ended up working on Wall Street in New York, uh, first at Bear Stearns, then at Goldman Sachs, and then at a hedge fund. And around 2015, I was planning to be an entrepreneur on something slightly different. And I was spending time in India. And one thing led to another. And my bank in India rejected my credit card application for a very simple reason that in India, I would be considered what is called a thin file customer from a credit bureau point of view. And of course, in the US, I had my Amex Platinum card and you know spent 10 years on Wall Street. So I would be considered an upper, upper middle class person, et cetera. And, and to me, that was interesting that none of that mattered. And, and just a credit score means everything uh, when it comes to getting access to some of the basics of payments, right? Sure. So that was the first aha moment that, that led to a bunch of aha, aha moments uh, for me to start Simple. Absolutely. And when we're talking about sort of the opportunity that there is in payments in India, I mean, what's kind of the the shape of that? What's the opportunity, the size, the scope when you think about bringing payment services to India? You know, when I stumbled into this real thing for myself where I did not get a credit card, it got me a little curious. And um, and I just started looking into things and I'll walk through what I saw, which is mind boggling. So first thing I noticed was very few people in India have a credit card, even right now. So roughly 29 million unique people have a credit card compared to half a billion people with a smartphone connected to the internet and almost 250 million people with a bank account and a debit card. So so you kind of like see that, right? So you see this interesting market where technology in some ways, which includes obviously mobile phone and internet, and of course, banking has reached pretty much every single Indian in the world. So you see that. The second thing that you see, uh, which is, again, a a very interesting juxtaposition is commerce, consumer retail is moving very quickly to the mobile platform. So people are buying online and people are buying on the mobile phone. But 70% of all transactions are still done with what is called cash on delivery, which means Mm -hmm. you'll buy from some e-commerce retailer like an Amazon or even take an Uber ride or or buy food online, etc. And you will, for the most part, 70% of times, exchange real cash at the point of delivery. That's one side. The other side is the financial services infrastructure. 
So not only people have bank accounts, but in India, what we have is what is called the India stack, which means a bunch of things. But the two most relevant things are there is a payment or settlement protocol called UPI. UPI stands for Unified Payment Interface, which for the lack of better analogy is like ACH in the US, except it's real time, 24 seven, and does not cost any money, which means you can actually move money between the bank accounts without any friction from a cost or time point. So you kind of like, you know, see this very interesting market, which is it's a 1.3, $1.4 trillion consumer retail market, both online and offline. Most of it is cash. So you see this market, which is kind of like still a little stuck in, in the yesterday. And then there is a part of the, the country and, and the same people leapfrogging to the new world of, you know, ubiquitous internet connectivity on the smartphone, buying online and still using cash, right? So naturally that means it's a perfect storm to create something new. That's kind of like our vision is. And to answer your question of how big this is, currently it is said that India is a $300 billion digital payment market. And it is widely expected within the next three years, it'll be, it'll be more than a $1 trillion uh, digital payment market. So, so India, therefore, is by far the largest and the fastest growing payment market in the world. So there's some opportunity there <laughs> to sum it up. That's just incredible. And thank you for really breaking that down. We've established, okay, payments in India, it's crucial to talk about. And there is an opportunity there for organizations to have success can you tell me a bit more about who your typical customers are right now and why they use Simple? Why does Simple really kind of fit into this ecosystem so well? Absolutely. So Scott, before I get into the customer, let me quickly define for your users what the exact product is. Sure. What Simple is, is a product that allows consumers to buy anything on the internet with one click. So it's a one-click checkout, like Amazon one-click checkout. The consumer gets a pay later account, very much like American Express, such that they can do multiple such checkouts across all the online retailers that we work with, which is majority of them now. And they just get one bill once in 15 days so that they can pay later. And they get a host of standard buyer protection features like PayPal did in the US so that consumers build more trust in online commerce. They feel safer and they feel in control in online commerce. And therefore, we are playing a very important role in the growth of online commerce itself. So that's what our product is and that's the problem we are solving. Our consumer, our customer, we have two customers. We have retailers, uh, online retailers as one customers. And the other is obviously the consumer who uses retailers uh, to buy something online. Now, you know, one of the things that we say at Simple, Scott, is... From a consumer standpoint, the best payment experience is no experience. Right. No one ever went to a store, whether online or offline, to make a payment. We all go there to buy, to enjoy the purchase, to feel safe and in control of the purchase, right? And typically the user experience breaks, right? Uh, something happens and there is this always this thing in the end where, where, where the user experience of buying is interfered by, by payment itself. And what a, what a better way to change that by having a thesis that the best payment experience is no experience. So that's how we think. And our consumer is a urban millennial who lives in a urban setting in India. They were born with a smartphone in their hand. They don't know of a world where smartphones are not there or even e-commerce is not there. Sure. They're very comfortable buying things online. They are native to mobile. In their other life, other than simple, they are exposed to world-class user experiences on their mobile, such as Spotify, Amazon, Flipkart, Uber, Ola, Tinder, Airbnb, Google Maps, etc. Right. So, so this consumer is a consumer who is really connected, really aspirational, really understands what the best user experience in the world is, uh, and they expect it every single place on the internet. That's our customer, and we are providing a, a payment platform to them that is at par with the world-class experiences around one-click checkout, pay later, and buyer protection, all in one stack, right? So these are not three different countries, companies. These are this is all three different products. This is just one product. That's incredible. Uh, Nitya, you broke out so many amazing things there. And the thing that you said that I loved most was this idea of the payment experience where it's not even there, you know, where they don't even notice it. 
We talk so much on this show and I talk to all these different founders, this friction in payments. That's always a a challenge. And I think there's so many organizations, certainly stateside and certainly around the world that are working to make that frictionless experience. And, And you're clearly doing that for your customers. Can you talk more about Simple's business model, especially in terms of payment industry terms, underwriting your risk, especially in a country like India, where financial data is very limited, and your relationship with merchants. What are some of the challenges when it comes to to these payments in India and navigating that? Absolutely. When you think about our business model, uh, I would divide that into like very quickly two different halves. One is the in- infrastructure part, the infrastructure we are building. And the second is, is, I guess, how we make money and what are the costs, right? So one of the things that we are doing is, uh, as I said, one click checkout like Amazon, one click checkout, uh, pay later like a Metro Express or a credit card. And then, of course, all the buyer protection features like PayPal, et cetera, all in one stack. So therefore, we are building critical infrastructure around identity, scoring, trust score, fraud scoring, and graphing consumers and connecting them to purchases, so what we call purchase graph, which we believe will be very critical cornerstones, like the three legs of a stool, for powering incredible consumer experiences online on mobile phone. So we're building infrastructure around identity, trust, and purchase graphs, right? So that's kind of like a very important component of our business, business model value creation, because if you think about uh, simple and what we all think about, I guess, payments in a traditional way is simple at the point of purchase, simple completely disconnects from the legacy of any payments, right? Which is why retailers and retailers product managers along with us can reimagine consumer experiences at the point of purchase, right? And we, we time shift settlement and therefore, you know, we have a lot of freedom to, to kind of like imagine what can be not only now, but in the future. Now, coming to the business model, of course, to do that, as I said, right, I mean, you are literally taking risk for a small amount of time. Um, You know, in our case, it's about on an average of eight to 10 days, but it is risk, right? You're holding that risk and there is a risk that settlement doesn't happen. And that's one of the most important IPs we are building. And as I said, we use alternate data. We work very, very deeply with our retail partners, retailers on data. And we create, using this data, as I said, underwriting models, what we call a trust score. So this is really not about credit in terms of affordability and an amount of money that is involved. This is really about buying small things frequently. That is where the power of Simple really shines. And therefore, you're not dealing with a lot of money, but you're dealing with a lot of people and a lot of frequency. And therefore, trust, uh, uh, you know, identifying intent and therefore trust is more important or are kind of like is where a lot of value rights as opposed to establishing affordability. So we use alternate data, machine learning, AI to be able to identify each people, like create a commerce identity. And then on that identity, create a trust score through that and write a customer. We work very closely with retailers to do that. Of course, in today's world, one of the things that we all have is so much data, right? And consumers can opt in and give us some data that allows us to underwrite them and identify them and, and say, hey, this is Scott. And this is Supriya and this is Nikhil, right? So we do that. And that's kind of my business model. In our business, consumer doesn't pay anything. The retailers pay a fees. And therefore, it's a, it's free to the consumer to use. The retailer pays us a fees, which is typically lower than even a credit card. And that's revolutionary. And what we do is, is um, for the retailer is we increase the cart size, the, the, the size of the cart uh, purchase, as well as we increase conversions. So that's why retailers think of us us as their best friend. And that's something we like. We like the positioning around being what we call merchant first and consumer center. That's incredible. And and just as you're kind of walking through that, I see how Simple has really kind of worked to solve that that problem you encountered when you went to get your credit card and you were like, wow, that's strange. Now you're completely sort of reinventing it and taking it in this new direction. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but... Also, I can see how this continues to get better as you have more people signing up, as you have more merchants joining the platform and you have more data, more transactions. Your ability to identify this trustworthiness and develop that would only increase. Is that accurate to state? Yes, you're absolutely right, right? So there are three things here, right? You know, compared to credit cards. First is, 
our ability to underwrite is obviously, you know, so much more powerful than a traditional credit card. And that power just keeps on increasing because with more merchants, more consumers, more data, more use cases, there is a flywheel, right? I mean, there is, these are continuously evolving learning models and these just keep on getting better, right? Just to give you a sense, obviously, when we started, you know, we started with heuristics, then kind of like use a lot of statistical modeling, regression, and, and for the last, let's say, two years, machine learning, Right now, our ability to predict early customer default is better than credit bureau data already. And it's just getting better. So we are already, uh, you know, kind of ahead with a traditional sort of method of scoring. So that's number one. The second and equally important part is, is cost of customer acquisition. So when you think about a credit card business model, right, I, I think where it breaks and where it's just not going to scale in places like India and emerging markets is how much it costs to acquire a customer, right? So you know that globally, let's say in the US, the average cost of customer acquisition of a credit card customer is anywhere from $300 to $700, right? In India, it's about $100 to $200, right? It's very expensive. And when you are acquiring customer at that cost, you have to give them large lines, right? You have to give them $1,000 or $2,000 line, which is very hard, especially in an emerging market context where underwriting has to be done through alternate data and incomes, just like even middle-class incomes, are not that large, are not that high to support a $2,000 line of credit, right? So, which is where something like simple, which underwrites using alternate data at the point of sale, distributes also at the point of sale. So our cost of customer acquisition is $3 compared to $300, right? And within 10 seconds or 20 seconds, consumer is able to click a button, onboard themselves, activate their account, do their first transaction, all in uh, 20 seconds and it costs us $2, right? So that is, I think, the most revolutionary part about the business model where we can give it to hundreds of millions of people very, very quickly, not only in India, but around the world. That's incredible. Now, Simple boasts a lot of benefits for merchants specifically, and we were kind of touching on this. You've got a 0% transaction failure rate, 20% growth in basket size. You had mentioned that up to two times frequency of purchases with simple checkout. You've often mentioned here that simple empowers merchants to build trusted relationships with their customers. Now, I understand that you have mentioned it really kind of focuses around very small ticket transactions. How do you see this evolving from the current pay later model? So, Scott, my view is, and that's our vision for Simple, that if you were to fast forward 20 years and imagine we are, we are sitting in 20, 40 or something, and we look back at the world, right, over 80 years or so of payments evolution, we would see three major platform shifts that transform payments, right? I think the first was credit card itself, right? That was transformational back in the 50s and 60s when you could actually have something like a piece of plastic plastic or piece of paper and walk into a store and just buy it, right, uh, around the country. Right. And then, in my opinion, the, the next major innovation was PayPal. And everything in the middle was incremental, right? Just making things better, but not something that leapfrogs in structure, right? So, so PayPal was the next big innovation, which, which allowed a new way to buy online where using internet enabled infrastructure to kind of like power payments, right? The long-term opportunity for pay later and certainly for simple is, is what would be that infrastructure in level leapfrogging and therefore infrastructure level um, reimagination of business model and consumer experiences for, um, for credit card in the world of smartphones, internet and commerce on the smartphone, right? So that's a question. And therefore, you know, just like a credit card that, that really power every use case, right? You don't have a credit card for coffee and a credit card for clothes and a credit card for a pet on bike. You have one credit card. And therefore, we believe, you know, the long-term opportunity is to have one pay later account and service all these use cases, right? So that's certainly what we are following or, or wanting to achieve. Right. We believe consumer interaction and engagement is stable stakes. If we are able to build a product build a user experience and build a use case where consumers interact with our platform multiple times in a day, in a week, in a month, we will be able to do all sorts of pay later that, that we all know of, right? So for instance, today, an average customer uses simple eight times, eight to 10 times a month. I'm sure that's not true for any pay later in the world. We have done north of 50 million transactions already. Compared to, let's say, some other larger pay later company, obviously they do very large ticket transactions and that's in itself very valuable. Uh, but in terms of engagement and frequency and how many times people use Simple, 
it's very interesting, right? Uh, DAU to MAU ratio is 25%. So 25% of all users that use in a month actually use on a daily basis, right? So, so we are kind of like focusing there. Uh, that allows us to engage customers, obviously get uh, uh, consumers engagement, build trust with the consumer, obviously get a lot of data and then expand use cases and revenue cases around other purchases that people also do, but maybe slightly less frequently and maybe slightly for higher ticket size purchases. But right now we are very much focused around the, the more frequency and small because we have not even scratched the surface here, right? Imagine media, right? Imagine the paywall, right? Paywall, right? I mean, how many of us have used a paywall, right? And how many have actually paid? Think about continue wall. Why should there be a paywall? It should be continue wall. Press a button, continue to read, right? And, and just pay later. So we are working on those type of things. 80% of all transactions in the world are under $10 transactions. That's where, uh, obviously, sizes are smaller, of course, but the, the amount of time people use it is 80%. And, and our goal is to be the market leader and really power that user experience. Uh, and that's when we, we focus on other use cases. That's incredible. It's, it's so much of a volume kind of thing. And as we were talking about earlier, the more data you collect and, and information you get, the more, again, use cases, services, things like that you can offer. I only have a few more questions here, but I really want to ask this one because I'm curious about adoption. Adoption is something that many payments and fintech businesses with new products or services they want to they want to drive that up they want to get consumers to download a new app sign up for a service it's crucial to growth what have been some of the keys to simple success with increasing adoption and getting both consumers and merchants to join your platform are there approaches maybe specific to india's consumers that have been helpful Yes, Scott, I think there is some some India-specific things and, and then some, I guess, ubiquitous. I'll first touch on a couple of India-specific things. Um, so one of the things that are fairly common in India is this concept of khata, K-H-A-T-A, which in other words is like a tab that you run in a store that knows you or, or a house account with a local store, which as you can imagine, is ubiquitous around the world, right? I mean, even in the US before credit cards started, it was common for retailers to run tabs on consumers. If you know the history of diners club card, right? you know, restaurants in Manhattan used to run just tabs on, you know, legal firm executives and banking executives and advertising executives so that they can have dinner with, with clients and stuff and not worry about having money because there was no card in there. So tab is a very common thing in India. Uh, it's called khata and it allows consumers to buy now and pay later. The reason retailers give the tab to the consumer is because the tab or the khata allows retailers to build a relationship of trust with their consumer. And the reason consumers use the khata is because the best payment experience is no experience. And khata or a tab is that experience, right? And therefore, what we have done is, is we, we uh, and that, that has been the inspiration or sort of the soul of the product, right? Our product is very much like a khata. We think of it as, as a tool for merchants to build a relationship with their customer and customers to have a very nice user experience and feel safe and in control of a transaction. And therefore, we have taken a very culturally relevant thing that is already there in a very low-tech way. Khata works. It happens in big cities like Mumbai and Bangalore. It happens in small cities, kind of like the city I grew up in. It happens with rich people. It happens with poor people and middle-class people, right? Old people use it. Millennials use it. Younger people use it. So it's like this... It's kind of like there, right? It, it's really there. And we have used that fact and just transform it for internet. So, so I think that is, uh, I think, important. You know, to me, building consumer products is answering one question, uh, which is what are the first principles of consumer behavior that you can tap into, which will never change, right? Because changing consumers is impossible. People don't right. change. Um, <laughs> right. Always, yeah. You can always tap into something that is there, and then kind of like build it and, and accentuate it, right? So that's a question we ask, right? We're not changing consumer behavior at all, right? Consumer have been buying on it. If anything, 10,000 years of consumer behavior suggests that people have been buying on a ledger, a khata, a tab, right? Before credit cards in the world, that's how it happened, right? So there's a lot of anthropological history to it, right? So, so we're not doing anything different. We are just doing the same thing that used to happen. And if, if anything, we are arguing credit card is a historical anomaly, right? This is only a 70-year-old experience, experiment where because there was not enough data and connectivity, 
you needed something like it, something as impersonal, which is a piece of plastic and six digits to be able to do transactions, right? But in today's world where we are reconnecting, right? I mean, imagine this world, right? For the first 10,000 years of human history, we had a world where we were connected always because we were living in smaller communities and smaller cities and smaller communities of even commerce. And then we had a world probably the last hundred years, which is kind of like disconnected because we are, you know, bigger cities, more countries, etc. And now we are back in the world where while we are in different countries and bigger cities, we're connected again, right? And we are connected on this massive mesh called the internet. And we have access to the cloud and unlimited compute power and access to machine learning and AI. How do you reimagine things that are fundamentals to human beings and commerce and relationships for the world of internet? but leveraging the connection again, right? So that's one thing. And the second is, is you know, I believe very strongly, you grow up when you build a great product. Our NPS, uh, you know, we get all our product consumers from uh, word of mouth. We got all our merchant from word of mouth. You know, it's all about building a great product, doing the right thing for the customer, aligning the business model to the customer. The original sin, in my opinion, in payments, and especially in credit cards, is that credit cards are adversarial to the interest of their own customers now, right? Charging 24% to 36% interest rate for revolver is a financial suicide for the consumer, yet it is the business model on which issuers side, right? So, you know, it's a classic adverse relationship, right? And that's why there is so much problems around transparency and ubiquity of fine prints there. And, and you could probably know this, 40% of all credit card spends end up revolving. In the US alone, that is $1.3, $1.5 trillion, right? Consumers are paying $250 billion on revolver fees. And when they bought something, they never intended to revolve, right? And we all know that revolver is financial suicide. No, no one is getting out of it, right? And it's a travesty that, I mean, it's okay. That's one of those things. It's a product that is legacy. It was very valuable 70 years back. It has lost its relevance. And now it's a rent-seeking product that just benefits when consumers lose. So I believe the future of internet, that's where, you know, I think internet allows us to not only build better products, better user experiences, but also build new business models that better aligns yourself to your customer, right? And I think when you do that, growth happens. Absolutely. The win-win, that is key to growth. If merchants are happy, if consumers are happy, that's how you get more people joining a platform and everybody winning. Nitya, Thank you so, so much for joining me on the show today, really breaking down the incredible platform you guys have built and really breaking down sort of the payments ecosystem a bit in India and the incredible opportunities there. So thank you for that. And before I let you go, if folks are listening and uh, maybe they're curious, they want to learn more about Simple and, and the things you guys are doing, where should they go? How should they connect? If you want to reach out to me, I'm on Nitya, N-I-T-Y-A, at getsimple.com, uh, G-E-T-S-I-M-P-L.com, no E. I'm also on Twitter. You can search for me at Nitya Sharma and go to getsimple.com, which is our website. And I would love to hear from your viewers uh, if they have any thoughts and questions. Absolutely. Thanks again so much. Thank you, Scott. Well, that's it for our show today. Thank you so much for listening. And if you like what we do here, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast listening platform is. We'll be back with another episode very soon. Thank you for listening to another episode of PayPod brought to you by Soar Payments. Soar Payments is a leading merchant services provider for e-commerce, high risk, and hard to place businesses. If you'd like to get the latest PayPod episode sent to you automatically, subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher, or visit soarpay.com slash podcast. <laughs>